That's my favorite little bar When a hot band's playing The people come from near and far That's where the women are hot The liquor is cheap And the food, it tastes so good So when I'm down and out I just think to myself It would be great if I only could in Georgia on the coastline Tipsy McSway's at 1414 Newcastle Street in historic downtown Brunswick, Georgia is your friendly neighborhood bar and grill where you'll find it all good food good music good times I want to go back to Tipsy's It's time for you to blow a fuse Come ahead and jump and shout And really get loud Guaranteed to lose your blues Yeah, by the time to go home You won't stay alone You're gonna find some TLC And for the rest of your life You remember the night Down in Georgia by the sea in Georgia on the coastline. Another Something in the Water podcast. I'm a co-host for you, Mr. Uncle Dave Griffin. I'm and Sean Clark, and we are here today with our dear friend, Michael Bond. All good to be here. Very good to be here. All the way from Claxton. Yep. Or at least halfway. You... I had to go pick her up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my car broke down, actually, uh, halfway, well, about three quarters of the way here. Mm. Um, thankfully, it was near a gas station, so wasn't too bad, but uh, that was definitely a way to spice up the day. Yeah, so I'm glad yes. to be, very glad to be here. Never a good thing <laughs> when your car breaks down. Yeah. Especially in the country. Yes. In the middle of nowhere. Very little in, service. And, yeah. In South Georgia. Nice yeah. country gentleman stopping to help. He did. He did. And I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, and it made me realize, hey, I need to learn more about cars. So <laughs> anyway, but I'm. Thankfully, you know, you you came to pick me up, so uh, it all worked out. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you here. We've been working at it for a while. <laughs> yes, it's we have. Yeah. 
It's yeah. the thing about uh, females on our podcast. We have <laughs> a, a curse. We have a hard time getting, getting them. <laughs> Even when they're headed here, they break down. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. It was a so curse. We've yeah. Some, we've had some that we booked and everything's hunky dory. And, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the day of, it's like, well, my washing machine just busted a hose. <laughs> my car broke down. Yeah. <laughs> but some, yeah, we are so sick. glad that, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, we was able to. Uh, Help you out of your situation Thank there. Thank you. I was and, very and, thankful. And get you all the way to Waycross. Cross. very thankful, yeah. Yeah. Um, when Sean introduced you, I thought for a minute he's calling you Michael. <laughs> and then I said, oh, wait a minute. Because uh, you've gone through some uh, a kind of um, an evolution name alteration. Yeah. yeah. So Michael is my dad's name. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I was your last child. So he he is the, you know, the Mike and Michael in. Um, but my... Full name is, you know, Michael and Boney. It's very difficult to pronounce. It's, it's right. difficult for a lot of folks to spell as well. And um, it seemed to be just the logical conclusion to shorten it a bit. Yeah. It's not like I changed it to something radical, right. you know. You're a, still a, a, yeah, it, paying I just, homage to him. Right. I just shortened yeah. my name. And mm -hmm. it's been, um, life has been good because people can actually say my name now. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's no longer a shibboleth where certain people can say it, certain people can't. And, <laughs> and I think what frustrated me the most was that a lot of people wanted to say my name correctly, but... Um, but couldn't and, and felt frustrated at that. So yeah. I just wanted to make things yeah. easier on everyone. There's, it makes sense. You know, it, life it's, is too short to not make things easy and, right. and accessible. Well, it's like the greats, you know, out there that uh, have a stage name. Well, uh, honestly, that was my only reservation about shortening mm. my name was that people might think that, you know, I wanted some kind of stage name like Ramblin' Rose or, you know, <laughs> just some kind of hoity-toity stage name. That really was not my intention at all. Mm -hmm. It was just that I have I had been called all kinds of things, you know, by people trying to say my name like um, like Macrolan or Michelangelo. I actually appeared in a, uh, a play that I was in as Michelangelo. And I thought, well, <laughs> huh, maybe I need to think about this a little bit. So uh, that kind of, Yes, that was probably, uh, yeah. Michelin, like the tire Michelin. company. Yeah, yeah I, I yeah, heard Michelin. Michelin. That was my favorite. <laughs> Mine too, actually. So, uh, you know, Micah <laughs> has been in my name the whole time, yeah. kind of staring me straight in the face. And, mm -hmm. and Well, that got me to thinking, and I want y'all to start calling me Shredder. <laughs> <laughs> I already you're, do, you're, Sean. You're still keeping the. I already do. You're still I got keeping the, the S. Yeah. <laughs> from sometimes, from Sean. Sometimes I accidentally, more. I accidentally call you Shark when shark. I try to say Sean Clark real quick. He comes out of Shark. Uh, so. That's a clever little combination, yeah. Sharky. Sharky, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds well, like it's about something about my character or something. <laughs> no, no, no. no. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've, you know, gone, gone by my short name now for about a year. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm just, I'm, I feel really out. good about yeah. it. I feel like it was a good choice. So to just let you know, she was M I C A H L A N, Michaelin. Mm hmm. B O N E Y Boney, and now is Micah Bond. M I C A H Bond, B O N N. Yeah. yeah. And you so, can you can probably find if you used to type in either one of those, your yeah, Michael and Boney or Micah Bond. Yeah, would, Michelangelo would, or Michelin. <laughs> Michelin, yeah. <I> think <laughs> something be, would come back on I YouTube. I think it'd be about the only person that, that comes up with, with that. That's one good thing about it. But, um, yeah, so Bond is my family's original name. It's, it's from Switzerland, and it's, mm. you know, Swiss French. Um, and sometimes it appears as, as Bonnie or, or um, it kind of got red neckified into Boney. Mm. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, there's a, a famous painting of Bonnie, you know, crossing the Alps, which was Napoleon Bonaparte. So I, I, I'm not sure what the origin of it is exactly, but, um, but yeah, I did some research. So Bon is where my family originally is. And um, I just thought, you know, why not go back to that? So, so Do you yeah. have any idea what it means? In so um, Bon, in, in? It, it comes or from the, um, the Latin word for good or hope. Bona, so, bona, yeah, yeah, bona, right? Good, good hope. Yeah. So, um, which actually is interesting because my middle name is Hope. So, um, it, it you just eat up with positives. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of a cosmic thing, you know. Yeah. So, so if you were to take my name literally, it'd be 
you know, Micah, which means who's like the Lord, and then hope, obviously, you know, and then bond, which means good. So it's a good hope. Um, yeah. So anyway. That's awesome. What's your name mean? Shark. <laughs> Shark. <laughs> I don't know. Shredder. <laughs> Shredder was It'd be from his awesome the, uh, songwriter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sean Ryder. Absolutely. Uh, Sean Ryder. Um, <laughs> is, wasn't Shredder in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Yeah, he was the bad guy. He was the rat, wasn't he? No, that's Splinter. <laughs> Shredder looked like the cheese grater. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That was way after my time. Yeah, it was for my time, I think. For your time. Yeah. So how old, tell everybody how old you are here. Well, um, I'm 20. I'll be 21 in about six months or so. Um, and it's been, life has been a grand adventure so far. And I've been very fortunate because I've been able to make music with wonderful people like yourselves. You know, you guys have been just a huge part of my um I hate to say journey because it seems like such a cliche word nowadays, but um, <coughs> such a influence. Yeah, such an influence on on me. And mm. uh, I've been able to, to travel around a good bit and study from different people. And um, it's been it's been a very interesting, um, interesting go. Yeah. Well, that's and, su sweet yeah. of you. To let we, everybody we know she's, you know, a, <laughs> she's, a, she's a multi-instrumentalist. Like. Right. We um, hadn't even told you what she, what she does, why yeah. she's on here. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. That was you. You've been in, yeah, an inspiration to us as well. Big so. time. Oh. Mutual <laughs> feeling is de definitely mutual. Well, I have to say, when I met you guys, it really floored me that um, that someone could develop their songs so well and be so well receptive by audiences mm. who usually are not pleased about hearing original music, I'll say. I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, most people would rather hear Brown Eyed Girl than, than an original song. Mm -hmm. And you guys are really the first people that I had met that um, were just, had such um, flowing talent with, with songwriting. And it was such a big part of who you are as a musician. And, I mean, it just thrilled me, you know. And I, I was probably... 16 or 17 when, mm -hmm. when we first started um, collaborating. That's right. And yeah. you really inspired me because although I had been a songwriter before then, I'd never really, I guess, had the confidence to really uh, develop songwriting. Mm -hmm. And hanging out with you guys um, certainly, certainly inspired me to do that. And I've been very thankful, very grateful to do some um, co-writing you know, with mm -hmm. you guys since then. So mm, I definitely absolutely. crossed it off my bucket list. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, before this podcast is over, we'll uh, we'll uh, actually play some of them songs that uh, we all uh, helped each other. Yeah, yeah, with, a uh, new one that we just finished. Well, we've really, I have really loved watching you uh, grow and progress because it's not to say that y y you weren't anything at 16. At 16, you were like, well, how yeah. uh, you've been doing. Uh, she's, uh, Sean said she's a multi instrumentalist. She is a multi instrumentalist. And, and a songwriter. I didn't she is a uh, fiddle, I guess, was your very first instrument. Um, technically, it was the violin. Violin. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to think about them being two separate well, instruments, they're really the same instrument. But I was studying classical violin, so I was mm -hmm. doing the Suzuki method, which is kind of the the standard um, tried and true method of 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 you know learning the violin. Mm -hmm. Then I went to fiddling. They wouldn't let me tap my foot, so uh, <laughs> so I went to fiddling and um, picked up the mandolin and also the banjo and I, I play guitar. And that's yes, all I'm and, I mean just your progression has just been. Um, I see. I guess uh, y'all knew each other first. Well, um, the way I remember it, yeah. which memory can be faulty, but yeah. the way I remember it is uh, we met at Curly Fest. Curly Fest. Yeah, yeah. And I was, I think I was 16 at that time. And um, we met at Curly Fest as well. Right. And I remember. Uh, I got to play a song with you or two. You were you were gracious enough to take a chance on a, a young upstart, oh, you know, on the fiddle. And I can't good remember as what you, good as you are. <laughs> that was no 
No oh. chance at all. No take, chance um, taking at all. <laughs> well, I remember we. I sat in on your set at, at Curly Fest, and then I heard you guys, the Pine Box Dwellers, later that night. I remember thinking, I've oh, never. So, oh, same day. Same day. Yeah, same day. Wow. Yeah, uh, double whammy. I remember thinking that um, I'd never heard of a band sound that good live. You know, you, the textures of your music and the the vibe just caught me just right away. And we uh, we did Like a Rolling Stone by mm-hmm. Bob Dylan. And I think that was just a an instant um, kismet and a, a bond that, that we shared was the love of Dylan. I think we talked beforehand and... Found out we both love Bob Dylan and yeah. said, well, let's do this. And yeah. So that was instant friends right there. Absolutely. <laughs> and how amazing that music has that power to, you know, instantly bond strangers. Mm-hmm. So. And you even threw a Bob Dylan tribute festival that we both played at in Sticksboro. Yes. Um, that was a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And that was at Eagle Creek Brewery with. Um, a lot of talented folks. I was so glad to get you guys in there. Oh, Thank yeah. you for that doing fun, that. Fun night. That was a good yeah. night. Yeah. Um. So okay, so we met uh, Curly Fest. Folks is a uh, is a little festival that was uh, thrown by a good friend of ours, uh, Curly McLeod, uh, around. Uh, it's Vidalia. A, on the banks of the Ohoopee River, up there in that Vidalia little triangle of towns up there in mm-hmm. middle Georgia, kind of. Um, uh, kind of close to Claxton, right? Yeah, not too Fair, far. Fairly close. Yeah. He would throw, it, uh, throw a festival every year for his birthday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this was probably the third or fourth annual, maybe? I think. I'm not sure. Or had he been doing that. it more, more uh, often? I think I think it had been going on pretty strong for a few years. Oh yeah, and I appeared there with um, the band I was playing with at the time, the Pig Eye Daddies. Pig Eye Daddies, and that's right. uh, yep. yeah, so we played there earlier that day. I joined you guys, and um, it was a very joyful experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a nice time for us as well. Um, and from that, uh, the festival that I put on down in Waycross, the Grand Parsons guitar pool, um, we booked you for that mm-hmm. the same year. So what yeah. year would you have been 16? Um, that would have been the same year. 20... Uh, so, yeah, 2017. 17. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, your first play uh, performance at Grand Parsons would have been in September of 2017. About a wow. month later it was off. And uh, and wow. you, <laughs> the crowd loves you, and uh, of course that's uh, you. You are uh, a great showman. Thank you. Really good job. I mean, you capture an audience. Now you, mm-hmm. that's uh, you're very gifted in that. Uh, Thank you. You, of course, you're a pretty girl to. Top, you know, I don't mean to get <laughs> weird, or anything, you. you know, I but uh, that. you, you've you've got that going for you. You, uh, uh, you, Talent, you're talented, the, yeah, and just all uh, the unbelievably you talented, and, and then and then you put it all together with a sense of showmanship, and uh, <laughs> look out, Hollywood, you know, yeah, or Nashville, or wherever. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I was just. Thrilled to be part of, of Grand Parsons Guitar yeah. Pool. And uh, I'll be there this year, actually, in October. Yep. And I'm mm-hmm. so looking forward to it. It's been, honestly, that was a real um, that was a real milestone for me because you guys introduced me to Grand Parsons. Really? Okay. Absolutely. Because I remember you said, you know, for the, for the Guitar Pool, um, you know, so much of your show needs to be Grand-oriented. Right. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I, I've heard of Grand before because uh, he had done – a cover of the the Dylan song "I Shall Be Released," mm-hmm. and I remember always liking that, but I didn't really understand who Graham was. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to to look over him, I suppose, mm-hmm. and his contribution, which is just is very understated, but so um, so integral to a mm-hmm. lot of you know 
a lot of the best music made by like the, the Rolling Stones and the you birds. Do. I'd always love the birds. So anyway, um, so thanks to you guys, I discovered Graham and obviously that inspired me to, you know, to become a more serious songwriter mm-hmm. and everything. So that was a, I'll never forget that. that. That first year that I played at Graham Parsons, I really began to delve into his music and um, I'm very grateful for that. Oh, yeah. Well, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, do, uh, you, the other thing that strikes me about you is uh, uh, being at such a young age as to how much you already know about music history. You may not have known a lot about Graham Parsons, but there's a lot of folks that don't. But yet, uh, you already knew who the birds were, probably. Did, who did you get your uh, musical knowledge from coming along, you know? Well, in a large Different part... Different people or family members? Or... Yeah. Um, well, in a large part, it was from my older brother, which I'll, I'll talk about. But mm-hmm. um, So the musical tradition goes back um, far in my family. My great-grandparents were from the Waycross area, and they had a radio show. Um, I forget what the name of it was. It was before my time, obviously. But it was every Sunday they would do like a gospel hour on the radio. Mm. Um, my great-grandfather, Jim Cox, he played the um, the guitar, and he did like a Chet Atkins style um, you know, playing. And I had a, an ancestor that, that played the fiddle. You know, I, I forget Hubert? his name. What well, I, I'm related it? to him as well, actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. So anyway, I had a an uncle Henry who played the mandolin, <clears throat> and they were from Waycross. And mm. then on my that was my, on my mom's side because they're all from this area. Mm. On my dad's side, um, my my grandmother Pat, she was a a chanteuse, an entertainer on the piano. <laughs> she did a lot of show tunes, and she um, gave me piano lessons pretty early on, which I did not take to the piano. I wish I had. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's not too late for me. But um, <laughs> but she was a very accomplished piano player, and then growing up, um, my brother was always the the very talented one in the family. He was mm-hmm. a he had a beautiful touch on the piano, and I remember um, him. I remember that being a big part of of his life early on. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a little family band actually starting out. It was, it was short lived, admittedly, mm-hmm. but uh, part of that was because he went off to um, to school to become mm-hmm. a physician associate, and he you know got married and um, and whatnot. But I, I continued on with music, mm-hmm. um, and that's why I played the mandolin. Is he played the mandolin, and okay. I realized that it was the same tuning as the violin. Yep. So uh, only you play it with a pick, not a not a bow. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, that was a big part of where I got my musical inspiration from because I'll never forget, um, Christmas Eve, I think it was 2009. I was around eight years old. My brother was playing Bob Dylan and I thought, who is that? And why is his voice so bad? Why won't he stop singing? (laughs) That was my first impression. Um, after that, I just fell so head over heels in love with Bob Dylan and his songwriting (laughs) And I had always written songs. Well, I had always written up until that point. I, you know, wrote short stories, and mm-hmm. um, my mom really nurtured uh, creative writing with us kids. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it was when I heard Dylan that I really wanted to to write songs to join mm-hmm. the stuff I'd been doing on classical violin with with the words that seemed to come naturally to me. And that was, yeah, that was. Um, Sort of the the genesis of that. Okay. Yeah, he's a good one to inspire you. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, he uh, sometimes he makes me just want to quit. <laughs> same. It's, same. it's <laughs> almost like when uh, uh, when John Prine hit Nashville, they said, uh, you know, there's this new songwriter in town. He's so good. We need to we need to cut off his fingers because he <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's just gonna beat us all <laughs> for sure. I mean, Dylan is a an enigma. And yeah. it's part of his magic. Definitely. I tell you. So the fiddle came first. And uh mandolin did, next, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mandolin second, and then the guitar. And uh 
uh, songwriting um, mm -hmm. somewhere in in the mix in all of that time. So you were how old when you started the fiddle? Um, I started classical when I was about classical violin. That is when I was about eight. And hey, okay. um, I went to bluegrass, like I said, and I really became interested in the um, just the roots of American fiddling. Mm -hmm. And I drug my parents or dragged them all across um, Appalachia to study um, with some old fiddle masters mm -hmm. there. And um, I competed in some fiddle contests like the Charlie Poole um, fiddle contest in North Carolina. And I just wanted to know where it all came from, mm -hmm. the Celtic roots of it, the African-American contribution that's so such a big part of it, and the storytelling aspect, which has always been there. Um, and I wanted to go and, and set foot in the places that it had all been born. Mm -hmm. So I remember one of the coolest experiences I had in the mountains was I went up to this place called Toast, North Carolina, where, um, well, it's in Surrey County, which is sort of like Mecca for any fiddle player. Okay. Because um, there was this style that was born out of there called Round Peak. And of the Round Peak style, there was um, the uh, very acclaimed Tommy Jarrell, who was a fiddle player. And if you go on YouTube and if you search um, Alan Lomax field recordings, Tommy Jarrell will inevitably come up because mm -hmm. he was such a... Um, such an integral part of um, old time fiddling. And he had learned from a lot of people that were uh, alive during the Civil War and had wow. retained a lot of the old tunings on the fiddle that had been lost. And he was, Tommy Gerald was a wealth of, um, of all this information, you know, from time long. Some different tunings from the standard? Yeah, wow. um, because the fiddle is very versatile in that way, much like a banjo. Yeah. And, um, Tommy Gerald was was a definitely a big influence on me, someone that I studied um, very closely. And so anyway, I one day I ended up in in North Carolina in Toast, and I showed up on the front steps of Tommy Gerald's home, and it was the place that I had seen um, so many recordings, so many jam sessions that had been filmed by Alan Lomax, mm -hmm. and. I'll never forget, um, I walked up on the, the front steps and I could just feel the magic. Mm -hmm. it, much like playing a guitar that's been, that's been played by um, troubadours, you know, mm -hmm. for many years, you get a sense of magic mm -hmm. and just a, a resonance. And that was exactly what I felt by going to this fiddler's house. Mm -hmm. So I, I walked up on the, <laughs> on the front steps and I, knocked on the door. I don't think I really planned out in my head what I would do at this point. <laughs> I just knew if I could get there. And some people came to the door and, um, it was, uh, his, his, um, I believe grandchildren that were still living in the home. And I said, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm Micah. I'm from Georgia and I know you don't know me. I don't know you, but I just love, uh, Tommy Gerald so much. And I would, I would just love to play some fiddle tunes on this porch. Would you mind? And and they said, no, of course. And they actually got their instruments because they all played too. Of course. And we had a, a jam session wow. under the big oak tree where so many of these um, famous videos had been had been made, these yeah. famous recordings of Tommy Gerald. Um, and that was right after I had won the, um, the Charlie Poole fiddle contest. So um, anyway, that was just a, a wonderful time. I think mm -hmm. I was about... 14, maybe I was 13, something around that time. Wow. So anyway, I've always had a, a deep appreciation for Americana music yeah. and, and to really know where it all came from. Yeah. Because if you're going to figure out where you're going, you need to know where you've been. Mm. And <laughs> to stand in a long line of tradition is very important to me because mm -hmm. information can be lost so easily. You know, that was the whole point of the... Um, the, the Dark Ages was all this classical knowledge from ancient Greece and Rome had been lost and it set humanity back many years. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if you're going to be a, a modern musician, you need to know who the heroes were. Yeah, and that's why uh, people like Alan Lomax were so uh, special. Absolutely. You know, to, to be able to uh, go out 
um, in the field and mm -hmm. uh, record all of these rural uh, uh, unknowns, uh, capturing that music, you know, that was, uh, music of the people, by the people and for the people and put it on albums for is that the one in the smithsonian isn't it? yeah is that i i believe different? that um that his work is in, in Lomax, the, yeah. the smithsonian especially his work with tommy gerald yeah you mentioned uh african-american uh uh i i'd always known about the banjo originating in africa but did did they have and and I've I've, I've known that they've had that are just as adept at I mean they uh, when when the steel guitar came into California from Hawaii Hawaii uh, it came in into white country music but it also was picked up by the black church there was a whole. Mm -hmm. um, branch of churches i can't remember the exact uh um name of it uh but it went underground wow in the black communities and they came up with uh, a sacred harp i think is what they call it a tuning that was totally mm -hmm. unlike the the uh the country music tuning that the white Wow. Folks used. And then it resurfaced in about the 90s, I guess, or 2000s with people like Robert Randolph. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, uh, the guy that Roosevelt Collier and all of them, they, their background in that, and they, all of those years, you know, from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, it was going on, on the surface. We were hearing it on the radio and everything with, uh, Hank Sr. and mm -hmm. all those great country songs, Nashville, Tennessee, and the legacy that was created there. But the whole while, it was underground in a black church communities. And wow, uh, that's fascinating. But totally did, different style. Of mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, what about the fiddle? Now, I know of uh, Papa John Creech from back in the day. Yes. Uh, yeah. He was out there in Los Angeles playing with Jefferson Airplane and groups like that. Yeah, but, Jorma Calcowin and mm -hmm. Yeah, um I've definitely studied Papa John. Um mm -hmm. I love his approach to the fiddle. I think he was very ahead of his time mm -hmm. because nowadays everybody's playing, you know, electric violin and that's what he was doing. Um <laughs> but yeah, um so the um I think in order to talk about that, we definitely need to to mention the banjo, because the banjo is actually an African instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and it was brought over and perfected by, by slaves, actually. Mm -hmm. And it made its way into um, Americana music, into folk music. Mm -hmm. And I play the old style, which is the African style, which is called claw hammer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that existed from probably the... 1800s till early 1900s or, or possibly 1700s till 1900s. Um, anyway, in the early 1900s, of course, Earl Scruggs came along probably, probably the thirties or yeah. so, although don't quote me on that thirties or twenties. Mm -hmm. uh, he invented three finger banjo, mm -hmm. which is the bluegrass hard drive in um, style that, mm -hmm. that we're all so familiar with. And before that existed two finger banjo, and before that was claw hammer, which is what I play. And I really enjoy just the lope of um, claw hammer banjo, the way that it accompanies the fiddle so beautifully, and the way that it functions as a storytelling, um, a storytelling uh, guide almost. Mm -hmm. Is so, that more uh, chordal? Yeah. So um, than than pick finger. Yeah, so, so the the rhythm is bum diddy bum diddy. So every song kind of sounds that way. That's the beauty and kind of the the down part of playing banjo is everything is bum diddy bum diddy. Mm -hmm. But uh, you you basically make what's called a ho hand with your with your hand. So it's about like this, which is just kind of the natural curvature of your hand anyway. And you just um, you have sort of this rhythmic, almost like a guitar strum. Mm -hmm. But whereas on guitar you're more like this with claw hammer banjo, it's okay. it's more like that. So yeah.
You come down with your nails and then pull up? Well, there you stroke with either your index or middle finger and it's uh you are um strumming and then plucking the the top fifth string mm -hmm. and sometimes oh, it's called okay. frailing you often yeah. do a frailing I've banjo heard it called frailing. Yeah. yeah so it's the same thing so mm -hmm. sometimes we'll say you know oh are you a are you bluegrass or no i'm a frailer so yeah <laughs> <laughs> they so, got a name for everything they sure do um and talking about <laughs> Fiddle, violin, they're one and the same, but uh, just depends on which side of the Mason-Dixon line you're on. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, yeah, so it is the same instrument. I get that question a lot. Um, but it is the same instrument, and you have um, small changes like the curvature of the bridge. A fiddle yeah. will have a more flat bridge on it than a violin. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and, you know, it, it has a different function. Um Violin is certainly a lot more um, technical than mm -hmm. fiddle playing. So that's why now um, I've sort of come full circle because I started out doing classical music, was interested in the roots of Americana music, and now I'm back to doing classical. So I'm currently, you know, completing um, studies in Bach and, um, you know, the Baroque period and everything mm -hmm. with, um, with classical violin. But it's interesting to see how everything is really one and the same. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you if you play good Bach, you can play b good bluegrass. If you play good bluegrass, you can play good rock and roll, good jazz, you know. So it's all really. So there's not much difference in the technique of <clears throat> one to the other? Well, I would say all the the most accomplished fiddle players have classical technique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But someone like Tommy Jurel would have a very um, different approach to playing it. Like sometimes you'll see fiddle players playing down here rather than up here. Mm. Um, sometimes their bow hold is different, not to get into the minutia of all that, but um, yeah, it, fiddle can be less uh, less structured than violin for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, folks, look at Micah Bond right here. It's like uh, uh, <laughs> she's a combination of Itzhak Perlman and Charlie Daniels. <laughs> Well, <laughs> did I say his name right? <laughs> Is it Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like Perlman, Charlie Daniels, a little bit of Barbara Mandrell mixed in there. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Uncle Dave. Thank you. Um, Devil went down to Georgia in D minor. That's right. Yeah. Which was based on a. Uh, Vassar Clements tune called. Um, I love Vassar Clements. I love yeah. Vassar Clements too. Oh I my saw goodness! Him. I got to see him too. You did? Mm -hmm. Where? Okay, stop everything. Where did you see Vassar Clements? <laughs> I saw him a few years, three or four years in a row down uh, wow. Live Oak. Live Oak, yeah. S Spirit of the Swanee Music Park. Wow. Spring Fest. Would that have been in the early two thousands, nineties? Uh, probably early two thousands. Nice. Definitely. Nice. Yeah, I, and I didn't even know him until I went down there, and I was like, Ooh. just like, Who wow. Who is this? Yeah. And then the next year, it was just every year it got, you know, my information I obtained about him got more, but, you know, <laughs> I was just like, wow. A legend. Yeah. yeah. He has just an approach to the violin that, or to the fiddle that you can just hear him play a few notes, and you immediately you know, know it's oh, faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, he played on... Uh, Dickie Betts' solo album after the Allman Brothers broke up about 76. He came out with a solo record. And uh, that's where I f first laid eyes on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, must have been 83, no, no, 82 or so, uh, over in Darien. As a matter of fact, they they were having uh, an outdoor festival concert. It was one night, like a Saturday night, and uh, me and uh, my then wife went over uh, you know, with a, a few friends, and it seemed like it was in a park in Darien, but they had camping area, and we pitched a tent, had campfires, and we're sitting out there in the grassy thing, and they had built a stage earlier that day. Jack Brinkley was one of the 
stage builders. He's an old do what singer from and a former DJ from Waycross and uh, been in a lot of bands through the years around here. But he was like uh, one of the lead construction guys on stage and uh, uh, makeshift stage. And they put up a big old sound system. And uh, Rodney Dillard was one of the performers. And I think Vassar Clements was playing with him. And Leon Russell was the headliner. And wow. so we were we were getting right, you know, just about the sun started going down. Bass Clements and Rodney Dillard was up there on stage. And I was enjoying, uh, thinking I'm glad to be alive, you know. The sun was going down. All of a sudden we heard this, Haram! just this uh, <laughs> noise, you know. Everybody looked straight towards the stage because that's where the noise came from. And we saw the left side of the stage collapsing with the PA falling down on the ground. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, but before that, Leon's bus had pulled up and was sitting off on the side of the stage there. And we were all, you know, we knew that Leon was there. We was hearing good music. Right. And knew that he was coming up. And then, kawam. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> and, gosh. Uh, and then... About 30 or 45 minutes went by, and we saw Leon's bus ride off. (laughs) Oh, And uh, then somebody walked out to the uh, microphone that was still working (laughs) and said, sorry, folks, concert's over. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, what the hell? Yeah. No rain check? Nothing. Well, see, Leon was smart. He was like, no, I'm not going to mess with that. Mm -mm." I'm out of here. I am out of here. <laughs> Got better places. Yeah. But I did get to hear Vassar Clements <laughs> live and in person. There you go. He was he was great. Yeah. I got to see Levon down there. Uh, oh man, you saw Levon. Yeah. yeah. I got it all right. Yeah. Same down there. I think that was uh, Magnolia Fest. But uh now you opened up for Levon, right? No. Leon. Leon, Leon Russell. Russell. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I get and Levon Helm was drummer for the band. band. Gotcha. See, yeah. I, I get those two mixed up. Right. But yeah, but you, you opened up for um for Leon Russell. Mm-hmm. So did Dave. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. makes uh, perfect sense. High point of my career. Me yeah. Too. Yeah. Boy, what that a, was something. What a big deal. Our, our good buddy Paul. Paul Lee arranged that for us. Yeah, he was he, he was up. Leon's uh um sound man. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, what was Levon's band down there in Live Oak? Was that the Levon Helm band? Uh, yeah, I think it's his daughter yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. her husband, and mm-hmm. I don't know who else. Was this would have been in the two thousands. This right? was after his uh, he had throat cancer. Yeah, right. And he lost his voice for a while, but this was like right after that. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, he um. Uh, Levon's contribution to to music has been so immense. Mm. I mean, his not only is he a fantastic drummer, but um, a great mandolin player, mm-hmm. and he just has that voice that you just instantly connect with. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm such a big fan of his music for sure. Um, especially his line. version of Ophelia. Mm-hmm. His voice is just like that's a friend of mine. Yeah, 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 yeah just exactly. Just cuts through, and that uh, yeah, that uh. Um, I'm reading a biography on Levon right now, and uh, that's the gist of it: is that uh, he is so accessible, and that that uh, you, uh, he never met a stranger. Mm-hmm. In other words, you could introduce him to somebody very first time, and you know it'd be like he'd known them forever. You know, mm-hmm. and that's what everybody said about him. You know, he's just so friendly. Yeah. Just uh, and like you said, his his vocals and his drumming, his yeah. drumming was just like a, uh, behind the beat or ha- however they describe it. They describe pocket. it as in the pocket or uh, not in the pocket. And when you're not in the pocket, it's they say it creates a tension. It's it's beautiful tension, mm-hmm. but it's almost like are we going to get back to? Oh, 
one right. again, you know. Right. It's like, well, oh, is it going to get there? Yeah. All good music. I've, well, not to make a grand sweeping statement, but like especially rockabilly um, and good bluegrass too. It sound it's at its best when it sounds like it's just about to fall apart. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think yeah. that, I think uh, Levon taps into that, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's actually very hard to do. It's it's mm-hmm. hard to to make it sound like kind of unstable, but actually, it, mm-hmm. it, you know, it is very stable. Like I think a good example of that would be Jerry Lee Lewis. You know, he he sounds like he's literally about to break the piano, <laughs> um, but he really has just this fantastic sense of internal rhythm. Mm-hmm. So when you know the rules very well, you can break them. <laughs> that's not, that's a that's a neat analogy. Yeah. So songwriting, Mm -hmm. what inspires you? How do you, uh, what's your process of writing a song? Yeah, well, I think everything inspires me, really. I mean, um, you know, throughout the day you are um, generating lyrics and ideas. And it's good to have a place to to compile them, like a a notebook or, or so. Um, so I'm careful to keep track of all the stuff that I, you know, generate. And sometimes, um, the things that the ideas that you don't pay attention to and they keep coming back to you are the best ideas, you know, the things that are persistent. Um, so I find that songwriting is not necessarily like an epiphany, like everybody might think it mm-hmm. might is, or it might be. Um, I think there's the the conception that songwriting is like lightning striking, and you have this song and it's given to you, and that is true in some ways. I mean, we are um, a conduit for something mm-hmm. bigger, you know, and, and we channel things, we channel ideas. But it's been my experience that um, actually the creative process is a slower, um, slower process than that. It's like any act of nature. Mm -hmm. It's brick by brick and it builds very slowly on itself, almost like an embryo developing. Mm -hmm. So I find that I, um, stay with my songs for a long time and, and I try to listen to what the song is telling me, how it wants to be written because your first inclination may not be the correct one. And I try to get to the crooks of what uh, needs to be said. I try to alleviate or try to get rid of any, um, to cut the fat, so to speak. As Tom Petty said, don't bore us, get to the chorus, you know. (laughs) Um, And I am very against um, sort of the standard way of writing songs that you hear so often in Nashville nowadays. And just it it seems to be kind of the pop way of, of approaching where there's very clear rules i i don't think that the best songs are like that i think that you know you want to push the boundaries of what's been done and you want to go into uncharted territory so um so that's sort of my process it's a it's a slow cumulative um process and co-writing helps especially when i'm doing co-writing with wonderful songwriters like yourself (laughs) so i love co-writing since I found Dave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I love your description of it there because yeah. that sounds you you said it so eloquently. I can't spit it out like that. Um that sounds like the way that I do it, you know. Yeah. It's just like it's no I hate rules. I don't believe in books. I mean, there's been books written left and right about the art of songwriting. Here's how you uh, come on, give me a break. It doesn't have to you have a don't chorus. know it how to, have to have a verse. You don't it know how it's done. Yeah. Nobody that I love it, it, it. Like you were saying, there's nature. It's natural, and there's magic. There's a magic in there. There's magic in childbirth, and 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 writing songs is a lot like a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you you you're bringing a child of your own into the world yeah. when you when you sit down with that blank piece of paper and you go at it. Yeah. And in the end, 
once you've got it nailed down to how it's supposed to be, you're proud. Uh, Absolutely. You got a lot of pride and, you mm-hmm. know, and I don't know about y'all, but it's a little bit scary to shove it out there in front of somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, just not to hijack the conversation, mm-hmm. but um, touching on the, the subject that you brought up about, you know, it's a lot like like childbirth. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a very famous statue, which I'm sure you've all seen, of um, it's by Michelangelo, and it's called the Pieta. It's where um, Mary has the the broken body of Jesus um, stretched out across her lap. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, it's, I think it's probably my favorite statue because um, not only does it touch on every parent's horror of sending out their child to into the world to be Mm -hmm. broken and, and, uh, abused. Mm -hmm. But it also describes every artist's process of creating something. So when you have an idea for a song, it's a lot like Mary, you know, having Jesus, because you, you think about, Hey, this could, this might just save the world. This might, (laughs) and I, I mean that in the sense that this might be exactly what people need to hear. Yeah. And this might touch someone in a, in a um, meaningful way. Mm-hmm. And it's something that needs to be said. So in that, that aspect is like, you know, the Pieta. But then um, also when you actually get the, the work out, when you're in the, the nitty gritty of creating it, um, it's not exactly like you might have your expectations up here and it might come out some by right here, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of the broken aspect because mm-hmm. every song, um, it, I think is a bit like that, but even though it's scary to put out into the world, to play it for people that, that may not frankly care mm-hmm. or, um, or that it doesn't land like you want it to each time. It doesn't match what you have in your head. It still needs, <clears throat> it still needs to be put out. Because, um, you know, if you if you don't accept the challenge and if you don't accept the possibility that it might come out a little broken, um, nothing good would come mm-hmm. of that. So you have to have the courage of Mary in that mm-hmm. in that sense. Well, and I, I do. You know, I, personally, I love all my songs, you know. Yeah, uh, and, and I have a feeling for all of them. You know, some of them don't uh, resonate like others do. You know, and then, isn't that interesting too? Seeing what mm-hmm. resonates with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. Is uh, you know, some of like you say, I, I like all of my songs, or I wouldn't mm-hmm. play them. You know, right. mm-hmm. but uh, some of the, my favorite ones aren't the crowd pleasers. Mm-hmm. You know. And not that I don't like the ones that are, but, uh, but I, I can see that, oh, this is, you know, mood, moody or, you know, (laughs) yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so cool to look back at your songs and remember exactly where you were when you wrote this lyric or exactly who helped you with it or, um, what you've been listening to at the time. And there's really nothing like it. I'll have to say it's, um, um, so grateful that we we all do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's wonderful to be able to share something that you've created with other people and and impact them and um and for it to for them to read in from their own experience into it as well. That's part of the beauty mm-hmm. of a song is um how it can be interpreted by people. Something that the songwriter may not have even right you know mm-hmm. seen in it like and I, I try to write in a, a way that not a not every situation but where it's vague and it's not really i mean you're being descriptive but it's, you really don't let them see behind the curtain kind of thing mm-hmm. and it's more about how it makes you feel and what it makes you know the the sound of the song or the feel of the song and, and even the words, even though they might, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I uh, envy that because I don't think I. I think you do that. I, I don't do enough of it. I mean, uh, my my uh, 
uh, tendency seems to be to spell it out, you know, a lot of times and to figure out ways to, you know, spell it out with a catch or cleverly with a rhyme or something, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. No, but uh, I love the vague thing. Uh, the you know, and, and I'm not. You I mean, I'm not. Good. I'm not always in the. I mean, I've. Written, I think you. I've learned it from you doing the the other way. You know, because I was never good at that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's something that I've learned recently too. Is the um, how to how to write in such a way where it is direct enough to impact someone, but also to be vague enough where it applies to everything. And I think a lot of my favorite songs are kind of that almost like non sequiturs, you know, mm -hmm. where not everything makes perfect sense. And that's really the way Dylan writes too, mm -hmm. is, you know, separate thoughts strung together. And that's part of the beauty of just poetry, mm -hmm. you know, but it's so cool that you can, you can write songs that are very direct and they are just a clear narrative wrapped up in a verse and a chorus. And then other songs that are, you know, more vague and ambiguous. And there's beauty in that. There's beauty in both of them. And mm. there's tremendous skill in, involved in, in both ways. I love it when, uh, uh, you know, you, you touched on it a while ago is, is, is uh, you, you don't want to force it, you know, songwriting process. Uh, you, you want to uh, let your heart guide you, not your head so much, you know. And uh, – just kind of get yourself out of the way, you know, and let it just come, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I love it when it, you're in that process of, of letting it just free flow, you know, and, and all of a sudden you've written two lines and there's an internal rhyme. And then, and I'm, I'm a big fan of that uh, foundational approach to songwriting that Jimmy Webb preaches about in his books. I've got a Jimmy Webb songwriting book. Boy, <laughs> you don't want to get into that thing now. You know, I'm talking about, uh, I just said songwriting books are for, yeah, but Jimmy Webb wrote one. There you, you go. You might better get that one. There you go. Because he's the one hell of a songwriter. Uh, MacArthur Park, you know, up, up and away in my beautiful balloon. This guy was well-rounded. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a highwayman. Uh, Galveston, dreams oh, wow. of an everyday housewife, Wichita lineman. This guy was oh wow brilliant, and uh, he. I read a little bit of his book. I just couldn't get too far into it because it was way over my head. And uh, but he equated the songwriting process to house building. <laughs> yeah. So you got your foundation first of all, and then you build the walls. You know, and then you build windows <laughs> and all like that. I said, yeah, uh, come on, man. And uh, the other thing that he wrote about is he said always, he said he always wrote, he was a pianist with a cassette recorder on top of his piano. And at, when he would sit down to begin a session, he would hit play regardless. Wow. A record? And record. He would hit record, I'm sorry. And he would start, you know, and would maybe maybe something would come in that session, maybe not. But when it did, when he when he did strike gold, you know, then it, it was always going to be recorded so he could go back to it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that he said. But uh, anyhow, getting back to what I was talking about was the, the uh, beauty of, uh, when you when you're in the process, and it's and, and you're receiving from wherever it comes from, and something flows out in a in a, a sentence there a line, and you have an internal rhyme. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I also like to do is borrow from Jimmy Page's process, uh, Jimmy Webb's process is uh, that. If you establish a meter, da 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 da, then you want to. That's the first two lines of your verse. Then you want to 
on the third and fourth line of the verse, you want to follow that meter as as close as you can. Now that's that's a rule that can be broken right there, and a lot of people do. But I find myself wanting to attempt to do to do it mm-hmm. very properly like that, you know. Yeah. And if the internal rhyme on uh, the first two lines falls on the fourth beat of the second line and then the last beat of the second line, your internal line like do and blue, Mm -hmm. then in the fourth line, I'm going to, I'm going to try to make that inter the new internal rhyme of that line rhyme at the same exact spot. Yeah. The fourth word and the last word. Chew and brew. (laughs) No, it don't have to be even uh, like that was kind of what happened in uh let me in. So you don't rhyme with the first Just time. about the time you change your mind, go from tossing flowers to shooting arrows in the wind. And those aren't perfect rhymes, but it's just about the time you change your mind, go from tossing flowers to shooting arrows okay. in the wind. I love that. So you got A A B B C. As far as the rhyme scheme goes, we way over everybody's heads now, ain't we? No, I mean, the brain loves symmetry, you know, and that, that's what you're trying to create in songwriting is a sense of symmetry. You know? Yeah, symmetry. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, you can make it a symmetrical process or you can just chuck it all. And that's the part that I love about it is that you can just chuck all all the convention out the window. Mm-hmm. Say, Jimmy Webb, you got your <laughs> way. <laughs> I got mine. <laughs> and uh, write a song without a chorus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I mean, do. Or without rhymes. Right, but do any of us sit down to write and say, I'm going to write a song with no chorus? No. No, it's just. It's but it goes back to. Happens. It goes back yeah. to letting the song go where it's going. Yeah. And sometimes the rules fit right in with what where the song is going, and sometimes mm-hmm. it doesn't. So. Well, um, rules are rules for a reason. Yeah. You know, things work for a reason. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that unless you're doing, unless you're writing a song as an exercise, saying like, "I'm going to stretch myself to try to write this without a chorus," because I've done that a few times, you know. And there are wonderful examples that that work that way. Um, but a lot of times, again, you have to listen to what the song wants and what it's saying to you. Mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of times you can see that and no one else can. And that's part of the beauty of of writing your own song is mm-hmm. um, is having the vision and sort of this this idea that presents itself to you. I know it sounds weird to say that, but oftentimes things present themselves to us. And it's up to us to see the potential in them and to realize it through our work. And mm-hmm. I think that's sort of the unifying concept of songwriting, to me at least, is when something presents itself to you, have the courage to see it through. Mm-hmm. Word. <laughs> you guys want to take a break and come back and play some sure. music and show yes, them? Absolutely. That sounds good, folks. We'll be right back with some music. Show them what's up. <laughs> Something in my brain won't let me stray Something in my veins gonna find its way Something in the water taught me how to pray When the cold black water finds its way into your veins You'll never be the same Hey, we're back with Miss Micah Bond. That sure is a pretty guitar you got there. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it is. Uh, so you got that from? Randy Wood. Randy Wood. Mm-hmm. In Bloomingdale. Brand new. Yeah. Um, it was It was hanging in a shop, and I was just, um, I fell in love with it from first strum. And I could tell the guitar had a lot of songs in it. So he, I, he built I, the guitar, right? He did. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's got that 
warm resonance that that his instruments have. They're characteristic How of How old them. is he? Um, I mean, well, guesstimate. I'm, I believe he's, well, he's definitely in his 70s. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure exactly, yeah. but um, he, yeah. he is, you know, still cranking out instruments and um, does a lot of wonderful work in his shop. Anytime I have anything um, going on with my instruments need to be adjusted, I always bring them to, to Randy. He, he, he made this one as he well? He did, yeah. He, he built my mandolin and my banjo, and they've um, just held up so well. And um, I, I just really can't recommend Randy's uh, work enough. <laughs> He's a wonderful luthier. Is he, like, close to Savannah? Mm hmm Yeah, so Bloomingdale is basically in Savannah. Um, okay. And he's from Brunswick originally, moved yeah. to Nashville, had a store next to the Ryman and has had a very interesting career. And I'm always just um, really shocked by how down to earth Mr. Randy is because, you know, when, when you've done the inlay work on Elvis's guitar and, and Johnny Cash, uh, is, you know, called you his go-to uh, guitar builder. You you might get a big head, but that just not is not, not affected <laughs> Mr. Randy at all. He just hmm. um, is so salt of the earth. That's awesome. Yeah. What uh, what's, what's this song that you're about to do here? So this song is um, a very autobiographical song, and I co-wrote it with Sean, and I love his touches to it. Um, you, had is, to, you had to get in her head? Absolutely, it's yeah. Autobiography. He's, you got in, <laughs> you got in her head, didn't you? Well, he helped me. Um, <laughs> he helped me present it, and I, I um I love co-writing with Sean. He's he's one of the best. Absolutely. Um, so I've had a lot of adventures and misadventures in music. <laughs> and while I was up in Nashville, um, I lived in a, a camper by the railroad track, and um, this song comes from that time in my life, which was a uh, a fun season, and it's called Pink Flamingos because if you've ever you know been around campers, you'll see a lot of um, pink, pink flamingos uh, decals. I, I remember the them well. They were popular when I was a kid in the fifties. Right, right. So we had them in our front yard. Yeah, everything. yeah. So there's that nostalgia, and um, so the song is called Pink Flamingos, and it's just about my um, you know experience thus far as a young musician. Cool. So I'll play it for you. Had my diploma, I was legal and loaded for bear Tried to win a trophy at the county fair A bright-eyed girl east of Durango Well, I played my fiddle and I rambled around Like an interstate gypsy going town to town Living in an RV with vinyl pink flamingos Whoa, 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 my heart had a song And it was singing, hey All the world's a stage When you got what it takes But it takes what you got Spent a whole lot of money to make a little dough But I didn't know where this road would go One night in a Beale Street bar in Memphis I was asking advice from a velvet Elvis And he told me, hey All the world's a stage what it takes It's gonna take what you got Bop, she bop Bop, bop, she bop Bop, bop, she bop Bop, bop, she bop Bop, bop, she bop The man in the suit wants to sell me a dream He said he'll put my picture in a magazine He'll take me as far as my credit card will go Oh, but I want to do something that's never been done Singing a song that's never been sung And if it's foolish, I'm too young to know So, oh, oh, if it all goes to hell
Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. You're so good. You're so sweet. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. I mean, I just, I'm amazed because I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, well, I learned it from you. No, you did not. <laughs> mm-hmm. The ability to sing and phrase on your guitar at the same time. That's stuff that Paul McCartney does. That's very sweet. You know, but being able to sing coordination, girl, and you got it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I've got you fooled. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. Yeah, right. Thank so you. uh, y'all, uh, y'all co-wrote that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We did. Um, it was in, in a in in a house in a uh, in a camper. camper yeah, yeah, with a pink fl- with pink flamingos <laughs> in it. Actually, that was kind of a reoccurring theme that I that I saw later and thought, hmm, that is that is be in the song. But yeah, so we um, co-wrote that back in probably. 2018 or something like that. 19. That was in your trailer swift. Uh, yes. Period. <laughs> trailer swift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like several things in the song jumped out at me lyrically. Uh, All the world's a stage. That's Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, the part about the guy in the suit and it's I'll take you as far as your credit card. <laughs> that is an age old ploy. Yeah. And I always heard that, you know, uh, coming along and said, uh, if you're a musician and, and you're hit upon by somebody in the business and the, they, they're they coming at you saying, man, you are great. And uh, um, we, want, uh, we want to sign you or we want to produce you or we want you to record an album. And uh, if you'll just come down to our studios and pay us $3,000. Right, drop us a check, uh, yeah. That's when you're supposed to turn around and run. But there's so many people that have to learn that lesson that don't yeah. turn around. Did that ever happen to you? Well, you know, they say that the uh, best way to make a million dollars in the entertainment industry is to start with two. So, <laughs> 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 uh, so I mean, it's just something that that you become more aware of as, yeah. as you progress and you realize that, you know, the music business is a business. And I mm-hmm. think that's a lot of what's wrong with it. And a lot of shadiness in yeah. there too. Did it, pers- it to be in your song, did it personally happen to you or were you like me that you were just aware of that angle? Well, I was always aware of it, but mm-hmm. that was something that became starkly um, a, a reality to me while I was in Nashville. You know, everybody, um, sort of has that that angle up there, mm-hmm. and yeah, was, they're just they're just waiting on you to come over the right s- city limit, you know. Right, mm. <laughs> and and it's like you know, it's so the is f- the fewer are the legitimate ones, the legitimate ones that will pay you money <laughs> to have you signed to their label or yeah, some, uh, company some, or whatever. Something like are, that, yeah. Are, are few and far between. Absolutely. And, mm-hmm. you know, you just, at the end of the day, you have to be your own advocate and you have to um, mm-hmm. do your own work because no one's going to give it and to you. And be on your own toes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, anyway, that was just part of my experience, you know, was just realizing, hey, this is, uh, in, in a lot of ways, the music industry is pay to play, which, again, I think that's why we see so much of a cookie cutter approach to, you know, to the radio nowadays. and mm-hmm. And it's like the music industry has a certain um, formula that works for them, especially we see that with the so-called bro country. So, you know. Songwriting, too. That songwriting element of uh, punch the clock, sit down in a little cubicle and churn out songs from 8 to 5, 9 to 5. The songs that are selling are in A and (laughs) They include these words. <laughs> and this topic, yeah. Get to work. Daisy Duke shorts. We need 20 more. Just Cold like beer. This. Yeah. Pick up trucks. River. You know, I really, I, I can't talk too much about that. Isn't that <laughs> tropical storm? <laughs> I really can't talk too much about that without feeling pretty nauseated. But uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but I'll, I'll have to say that's something that, um, you know, attracted me to, to y'all's music is it was just very 
authentic and there was nothing contrived about it. There, nobody was, you weren't trying to hit on certain hot topics. You just mm. sang from the heart and wrote from the heart. And it was very apparent, you know, just from the first song that I heard from both of you, I could immediately tell that. And I think that's, you know, part of the magic of this, um, this community in Waycross is, mm. is a, a nurtured sense of authenticity. And plus we're broke. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> helps with the music making. No, I remember somebody, it might have been Sean that said it uh, years ago. We used to talk about how wouldn't it be nice if, if uh, somebody from down here could make it and then kind of, uh, or somebody that we knew could make it and then just kind of pick everybody else up. But somebody described it as a, as a wheel that's going around, you know, and, uh, and they said eventually that wheel's going to land when it, you know, like the magic wheel you spin mm -hmm. on the game show and it's finally going to land. The pointer is going to land on Waycross. <laughs> <laughs> it hadn't done it yet. but Well, you know, <laughs> oftentimes you're not aware of your own um, importance and oftentimes it takes other people to, to show you that. And, mm -hmm. you know, Uncle Dave, we are – musicians not just in Georgia but far and wide are really indebted to you for for all your work you have such a, a far-reaching arm and in music and you um <laughs> you really do and we are very indebted to you for all your work that you well, do with the Grand Parsons Festival and I mean that I can't imagine what a, a labor of love that must be and I just appreciate that you go through the trouble of putting it on for us all it, and it, it certainly changed my life and I, it's touched the lives of so many and um i think they should give you the key to the city in waycross i really do i'm <laughs> you know i'm just being honest and well, that's sweet and, and the you. same to you sean i mean yep. you know your your influence he's batman i'm just robin <laughs> <laughs> um you know you guys y'all are so loved so appreciated truly it's it's a beautiful thing Thank you. Well, you are too. <laughs> mighty sweet of you. Well, I mean Well, it. uh let's do let's do another one. Okay, absolutely. Let me grab the mandolin. All right. Yeah. So that song that you just started us off with was written in a camper trailer in an airstream. Mm -hmm. 1971 airstream. Oh wow. With pl pink plink from <laughs> Pink flamingos. <laughs> I was about to say you have a better memory than I do. Yeah, I think it was a seventy-one. And uh, uh, you and I uh, co-wrote in that airstream too. Mm -hmm. uh, was that my back grandma's in, house? Uh, in uh, July of twenty eighteen, uh, we wrote a song together uh, called "Who Put Josie in the Whale." Right. And uh, so, with all of this. Uh, camper trailer songwriting sessions going on, I decided to uh, buy my wife, uh, just kind of fulfill the dream that she had. She wanted a hippie little hippie camper trailer to uh, carry down to the festivals and and sleep in and everything. And so I, f I found her a, a little frolic. I think it's like a 1964 frolic. It is cute. And we parked it in our front yard, and uh, you uh, messaged me back a couple of months ago, or about a month ago, I guess it was, and uh, uh, scheduled a little songwriting get-together in our camper trailer. Right, yeah. So we got this camper trailer thing going on now. We sure do. And uh, yeah, it was a song that, uh, you had already commenced to writing another one that you and Sean had commenced mm -hmm. together. So Sean and I started um, in the in the seventy one airstream. Um, actually, at the same time that, uh, that you and I wrote um, Josie in the Well. And oh, okay. The song um, we had the first two verses, and I always knew it was a good song, but um, there, I guess, other things were happening, and I just never finished it. And um, it was not until I was um, staying with uh, my friend Jerry Gowan. He had a, uh, a very cool old Martin 
guitar that was um, belonged to a friend of his, mm -hmm. and I could just tell that the guitar had been, um, you know, played so much and had so many songs in it. And I picked it up, and um, the the chords just came to me for um, for this song, which is called "My Little Love." that Sean and I had been working on and um, it seemed to just to just click mm. and um, it'd been you know a slow process because we'd started um, about two years ago and just kind of put it on that on the shelf um, <coughs> so I strummed this old Martin and it just um, came together for me so well and I thought wow that's the melody and those are the chords and so I um, I contacted you and and mm -hmm. you and and Connor and I got together in in your um, camper <laughs> and we finished it and um i'm that's a two camper song that's right yeah <laughs> a du double whammy so um anyway i'm uh about to release a, a recording of this with chris henry and um, i'm very very excited for it but um i think it's so cool that we get to play it because you know the three of us co-wrote yeah, it um it look magic so, yeah yeah now here we go folks uh uh a triple co-write <laughs> in a two camper trailer. Right, right. And uh, called My Little Love. April rains were mighty lonesome And I was feeling sick and numb in a hiding place that knew no boundary and in a time that knew no love I was a rover and a rambler until I wound up sinking fast the only place that I could turn to was the harbor of my past My little love, don't go where I can't follow My little love, don't roam where I can't be I wish that I was going with you Or you were staying Quiet night, restless dreams gather around me till I walk in morning light. Beyond the dark, I know that you're waiting with a love that has no end. Be the rock of my salvation. Fill me up and break me down again My little love, don't go where I can't follow My little love, I'd never tell you wrong Stay with me and let's go together Into the open arms of song Nice. Thank you guys for playing that with me. I appreciate that it awesome. so much. It's my little love. Full circle. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Michael Bond, Sean it. Clark, Uncle Dave Griffin. <laughs>
Yeah, it is full circle. Uh, Connor had some help in that too, right? And Connor Griffin. That's right. That's right. Connor yeah. Griffin. Dave's always trying to cut That's him out. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it's like, it's like the opposite of nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, damn boy. <laughs> Dave's like, just make out the check to me. <laughs> <laughs> He'll get his. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> so yeah, you well, mentioned uh, uh, being over at uh, my old friend, Jerry Gowan. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. and I, uh, I think we're the same age. I believe he might be a year older than me or so. But uh, he and I met way back in the day. He was uh, from Folkestone, Georgia. And that's only 30 minutes from uh, Waycross. And I knew that he played in the band. So when I started playing the band, I was 18, right out of high school. And he was probably well into a seasoned veteran by then. But the thing that I remember about Jerry, he had a band in folks. It was about a, seemed like it was about a seven, seven piece band, six or seven pieces. And they, they took a famous publicity photo for their band they were standing on the roof of a restaurant right there in Folkestone as you go through the uh, one of the main traffic lights there. Uh, there's a, a Okie Finoki restaurant on the left there at the intersection. <laughs> and mm-hmm. way back in the late 60s, early 70s, they all climbed up on the roof of that sucker. And somebody stood on the ground and took a picture of them on the roof of the restaurant. Well, so there you go. That's that's my my Jerry Gowan memory. <laughs> Other awesome. than that, I do know this about him. He's one of the greatest uh, musicians. I mean, technical. He's he's a he's he's a keyboard player. Yeah, yeah, extremely and, technical, but also soulful. He, yeah. You know, Does he play anything besides keyboard? Um, he plays guitars. really good guitar. Yeah, and I'm, I'm always he trying did, to get yeah. him to play guitar at one of our shows because mm-hmm. it's so good. Um, so yeah, um, he can just play any genre. One of the most versatile musicians I think I've ever met. Y'all, yeah. y'all are doing some work together. Now, we right? are, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're actually going to be at, at um Grand Parsons Guitar Pool in October together. Oh, good, good. Yeah. So that's been such a a fun project. It's working with him and. Um, we've been doing a lot of, um, well, you know, everything from Gershwin to Guy Clark, really, yeah. um, some jazz tunes and, and then some bluegrass. He's one of the few piano players that can play bluegrass piano. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I've really enjoyed that. Well, and, he's, he's from the South, from yeah. South Georgia. So he's steeped in the traditions of, Absolutely. of all of the Absolutely. Stuff. He's, he's highly trained, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, but he doesn't. He doesn't talk about that a lot, and I think that's. Uh, y'all got a video that just crept up on Facebook in the past week or so. The two of you sitting there performing. Car- uh, Chartus. The Chartus. Yeah, the violin piece. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's it's a, like a um, gypsy sound and thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a classical piece by Monty, but it was. Um, it is gypsy because it's based on the um, the Hungarian folk dance, which yeah. a, a chartist is a as a type of traditional dance. Oh, okay. So yeah, um, that was that was fun. I roped him into that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, very good. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun to make. Mm-hmm. He's a great guy. We should we're we're going to have him on, right? Yeah, oh, you guys definitely need to. We've got to. He has so yeah. many interesting stories. I mean, just what a career he's had. Yeah. yeah. What some of the other. Uh, you got some other projects going on with uh, players. I do, yeah. So um, I'm playing with um, Scott Bachman in a group called Fiddlesticks. It's just <laughs> me and him. And we have um, had very warm reception in the um, St. Simons, Brunswick area, and the Savannah area as well. Um, and that's been so much fun. And whenever, you know, it's just the fiddle and the drums, um, I enjoy doing live looping, which allows me to play like bass and, and rhythm, rhythmic stuff on the, mm. on the fiddle. Um, so we do like Led Zeppelin and wow. you know, disco and, um, and some bluegrass as well. And just a, a good mix of everything. Yeah. Um, and then over in the Bullock County area and beyond, I have a, a duo with um, Brandy Harvey, and we're called the Maybells. And we do um, more traditional music and, and also some jazz as well. And uh, we have a Facebook page, and 
I've really enjoyed um, these collaborations, you know. No with, kidding. With I saw some uh, videos of that, and I really liked it. Uh, Thank you. I have not seen the Maybells, but I want to. It's been fun. Brandy yeah. is such a tremendous talent. Mm -hmm. And she's she's actually from Waycross, believe it or not. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so he, I think you guys need to have her on your podcast. She's uh, something to do with that place in Statesboro, right? The Averett Center? Yeah. Yeah, she's very involved there. Um, yeah. I actually work at Averett Center. I teach um, fiddle lessons there in mandolin and guitar. Mm -hmm. And um, she teaches there, and she is involved in a lot of the, the productions they have. So we were doing the um, Love Always Patsy Klein production there. Mm -hmm. And she plays Patsy Klein and just, I think, was born for the role. She, <laughs> oh, man. Not only does she have her voice down pat, but just she just becomes patsy it's so so cool to see nice yeah well folks it's about time for a tale of the week and uh being as we're uh in the month of uh november uh, about a week before thanksgiving where are you going this time for thanksgiving you going over to your mom and them's <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> well, it is it's a good time of the year. Thanksgiving is always a, a kind of heartfelt, you know. It's good for your stomach, too, but... Uh, <laughs> a lot of good sleeping. A lot of good sleeping, because turkey's got tryptophan in it. Mm -hmm. One time I had a bad tryptophan, though. <laughs> I like, to, I like to never come out of it. <laughs> he laid on the couch and his nephews and nieces couldn't wake, wake said, him up. Talk me down, man. Talk <laughs> me down. <laughs> well, this was, uh, this is telling the week about Thanksgiving. My older and only brother was born on November 23rd, 1950 in Montgomery, Alabama. I could always tell it was his birthday because of the overwhelming odor of turkey and dressing, sweet potatoes and cranberry salad. Mama took no quarter and spared no mercy for an indifferent nostril or an unhungry stomach. You would eat and it would be fabulous. Thanksgiving in all its culinary splendor takes on different memories for different folks. My fondest turkey day memories are from the time I was a young adult. I suppose I could appreciate the rosemary and thyme more, whereas before I might have thought it was just a nursery rhyme or a song from Simon and Garfunkel. But I'm sure Mama got it from her Mama, and so on and so on, until the blessed Indians and pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. All I know is the whole house smelled like heaven for a day and a half. Plus, there were those glorious leftovers that might last for several days, or at least until they're gone. The pilgrims and Indians, God bless them, had no clue just how good a turkey sandwich with mayonnaise was, or we may have never had Custer's last stand. <laughs> Savita Mae Carter Griffin, my mama, could cook. A sure enough country girl, she was raised on a farm in western Brantley County just outside of Hoboken. The second child of Everett Cecil Carter and Leela Virginia Strickland, the old farmhouse sat in the middle of a dirt yard that Grandma would sweep daily. You see, because back in the day, it was more work to have grass in the yard. You'd have to keep it mowed. Besides, you wouldn't be able to see them chicken egg eating snakes and hiding. So they would just not grow grass and you'd just leave the dirt out there and they'd get out there and sweep the dirt. There was a cool shaded front porch spanning the width of the house with a three-person swing on the left rocking chairs scattered about. The front door led straight down the main hall, living room to the immediate right, bedroom to the left. That bed, always, always adorned with a floral chenille bedspread and a teddy bear won from the agricultural fair by either Uncle Vance or Uncle Bud. Then two more bedrooms down the hall to the left and right before entering the kitchen, which sprawled across the rear of the house. I remember Grandma Carter's kitchen from a very early age. It smelled like flour and wood smoke, and the food that came from there was better than any Hardy's biscuit I've ever had. 
Oddly enough, when I stroll into the Flash Foods on Plant Avenue in Waycross, the one with the crystal right inside, I smell my grandma's kitchen. So I stroll there often. Her table was long and welcoming. At Sunday dinners, which we went to each and every Sunday, the plates would be turned upside down before we ate. A little odd, I thought, until I realized that houseflies like to eat too. When the meal subsided and the men stepped outside to smoke their Prince Albert tobacco cigarettes, Grandma just threw a big tablecloth over the food, and it stayed right there until supper. By the mid-60s, my grandparents finally owned a refrigerator with a freezer up top, and in that freezer was the best strawberry ice cream popped out of an ice tray in sumptuous pink cubes that flaked off on your tongue. The ice cream came inside a little box that I'm sure she bought from Setzer's or Colonial Grocery Store in Waycross, a little three-and-a-half-ounce box with the name Junket across the front. They also modernized to an indoor toilet when Granddaddy built a septic tank in the backyard just a few feet from where the outhouse ceremoniously stood. Oh, the horrors that outhouse caused me as a youngster. It wasn't so much the corn cobs or the Sears catalogs as much as the chickens that roamed around underneath my young lily white behind. <laughs> if, if that ain't a Stephen King movie waiting to happen, well, I don't know. As many, as many family traditions go, Thanksgiving brings us all together. And these days, that seems to be harder and harder to do. I have fond memories of my aunts, uncles, and cousins gathering around the table amidst laughter, stale cigarette smoke, king-sized Coca-Colas, and cotton aprons full of love and gravy. Makes my heart smile, and I can recall dearly the song that we sang. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Gary. Happy birthday to you, my only brother. <laughs> I like that song. I know all the words. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, Dave. Oh, that thank wonderful. you. That was the tale yeah. of the week written by Uncle Dave Griffin. I've got a book here. If you want a copy of this book, all you do, uh, all you have to do is Arm send us a, a, a uh, email to something in the water podcast at gmail.com. I'm going to have to get a copy. Oh, you got yeah. it, girl. I got one in my trunk right now. There you go. You got to read it. And uh, um, I, I had a, a, yeah. a thought that I was going to uh, say there, uh, but it has escaped me. Well, but um, why don't we do some more songs? Sure, you, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I just want her to play. get the fiddle out. Yeah, she yeah. plays more than just guitar and mandolin. We haven't folks. Uh, had a fiddle on the podcast yet. So. Okay, yeah, let me go um, get it and it can be make another... sure it's in tune. <laughs> oh, I thought it was over there in the corner. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah, I'll, we'll be I'll right be... back with a fiddle song. Well, folks, we promised that we would finish with a fiddle, and here we go. Uh, <laughs> You want to tell us about that beautiful yeah. thing? Yeah. So um, this was a, or this is a fiddle that used to belong to my um, my first fiddle instructor, Mr. Eddie Hoover, and I took from him over at Randy Woods um, Guitar Store, and um, he he passed away I think last year, and his son was um, was gracious enough to um, to give me the fiddle Ooh. and to to allow me to to play on it. And so you hadn't had it long. Then. No, sir. No, but it's, um, I, it really means a lot to me to play. It's beautiful. I love the trim around the edge. Thank there. you. That, yeah. That, the the perfume. Um, that bind, uh, it's not, well, is it binding? It, yeah, is it, it is yeah. binding. I, I guess it's called perfling, but it perfling is basically yeah. just binding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Mr. Eddie was a fiddle builder, and he did wonderful, um, you know, repair work on fiddles. So it's it's set up like he liked it. Yeah. So I, I enjoy that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, I like to play a song for you guys that was um, written by Guy Clark and Sean uh, Camp, and it's called um, Sis Draper. And actually, Sean um, turned me on to this song, and I. I had to learn it as soon as I learned, as soon as I heard it. 
Um, Sis. Sis Draper. Sis Draper, yeah. Right. It's it's about a, a real fiddle player that lived in, in Arkansas long ago. And when she would come to town, um, she would just, you know, bless the, the townsfolk. And, you um, recorded this or is it? Yeah, I have a, a recording coming out soon for it, um, which you'll be able to find on my YouTube channel. And it's the, the, the tune is Arkansas Traveler, which was um, written long ago from the 1800s. It's a Celtic tune. Wasn't that one of the first songs you learned on the fiddle? It sure was. Actually, Mr. Eddie taught it to me, so it's, it's all oh, wow. full circle. Um, so, yeah, and then Guy Clark put words to it and um, with his co-writer, Sean Camp. So, anyway, I'll play it for you now. It's a, it's a real toe tapper. <laughs> Tuck them babies all up snug Sis Draper's coming over We're all gonna cut a rug When you see the lantern swinging yonder Coming up the hollow road Them dogs will get to barking Ought to tie them all up with a rope Now you boys better get in tune Sis Draper's gonna be here soon Don't shoot no dice or get too tight If you're gonna pick with Sis tonight Now she came down from the Georgia mountains There was lightning in the air Honey on them fiddle strings Magnolia in her hair Now she's a diamond in the rough If you can't feel the shine that's tough She'll play all night for the likes of us Sis Draper's got the touch She'll play all night if she feels like it Have some fruit punch if you spike it Sis don't care who don't like it Sis has got a hell of a bow arm on her Now she stepped up and sawed one off Uncle Cleve dropped his jaw He said, she's the best I ever saw She must be from Arkansas Now I think Grandpa used to date her Grandma says she still hates her All the fellers stand up straighter In the presence of Sis Draper Sis Draper is the devil's daughter Plays a fiddle daddy bought her Plays it like her mama taught her She's a traveling Arkansas girl now she put her fiddle in a box and said it's getting off late she's on her way to little rock little rock can't wait now we all stood out in the yard hands all full of watermelon watched her leave and watched her go wishing we was in that wagon Sis Draper is a devil's daughter, plays a fiddle daddy bought her, plays it like her mama taught her, she's a traveling Arkansas here. I'm gonna speed it up. fun to play yeah like steve martin says about the banjo you can't play anything uh sad on it you know? <laughs> i have to agree yeah yeah it's it that's especially very um very fun tune mm -hmm. arkansas traveler yeah <laughs> that's beautiful yeah and just the the clever lyrics of guy clark make that one of my favorite mm -hmm. songs i love that song <laughs> yeah well i have you to thank for it glad thank you, you for, for glad sending you it to uh, me. You know, learned it and all that's cool. Yeah, it's been it's been several years ago that I first heard it. Yeah. So tell us what you're doing now. Um, well, um, I'm going to school, uh, going to college, and um, that's been a, an interesting adjustment. Um, and I've where at? Um, well, right now I'm at a junior college, and I'll be transferring soon to uh, to a larger one. Okay. Um, but I've been studying, you know, science and mathematics and um, it's been interesting because I've seen all the 
the overlap between um, music and and science. And there's a lot oh. of there's a lot of science and music and a lot of art and science. Oh. So um, anyway, it's been keeping me busy. That that's for sure. I would have figured it would have been math. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I know that math's in music, but I never mm-hmm. figured on science. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah, I especially think of the violin as being, you know, kind of scientific in its approach. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. There certainly is a lot of, of music, especially a lot of math and music, um, especially a lot of, you know, math and music theory and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But that's been cool. interesting. And it's kind of given me you know, more to write about as a songwriter, yeah. which has been um, a very joyful experience. That's awesome. Cool. You, you, it's good to have a, a, an education, you know, to go along with uh, what you're doing musically and everything. You know, they always say back in the day, they used to say, get an education so you can have something to fall back on, <laughs> you know, if, mm-hmm. if the music don't pan out. You know? Like Brian May, the guitar player, lead guitarist for Queen. Yeah, he's an astrophysicist. In, <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> yeah, took that, it to heart, didn't he? He, he sure did, yeah, to the highest degree. I'll go yeah. get my astrophysics <laughs> <laughs> degree. Yeah. <laughs> and then play in one of the best bands in the world. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. That's um, that's pretty amazing that, that he could do all of that and and to see really how everything flows together. Yeah. you know um and and to realize that um there is a there is a, a science to music making and and um and an artful aspect like i said mm-hmm. earlier you know it, it, the two have an interplay between each other mm-hmm. so um that that's been a lot of fun and you know it's kept me busy um i've lost i have lost a bit of sleep uh in the process <laughs> no of, of going to college but um, I really enjoy it. I just love having a, a textbook in my hands. Yeah. So anyway. You've always been learning something since I've known you. You just like, <laughs> which is awesome. I wish I had that drive to just keep, <laughs> you know, all the instruments and and uh, that Kung Fu you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess with it, boys. No. Um, I've been studying a little bit of jiu-jitsu and I'm, I'm very rusty here. I, I really need to get back to class. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, you know Bob Dylan said, "He who is not busy being born is busy dying." So I've, yeah. I've taken that to heart. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just such a such a big old world, and there's so much. Didn't to- he also? Didn't he also say that? And if jiu jujitsu don't work on them, you can always stab them with your fiddle bow. <laughs> <laughs> You put wrap, their eye out the with bow your, around their neck. Yeah, you put their eye out with a fiddle bow too. <laughs> um, if the jujitsu don't work, you can just uh, <laughs> put their eye out with the fiddle bow. Well, I've I definitely need to get back into jujitsu. That's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a lot like like playing music. Believe it or not, um, there's there's a certain rhythm to how you do things, a certain attack um, to how you approach something, and um, and a, a formula. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's been interesting. <laughs> but yeah. Cool. Um, tell the folks uh, kind of what you got in mind for early part of next year. Uh, yeah. So on your land up there in Claxton. Right. Um, so I would like to uh, put on a, a songwriting um, seminar and concert with with you and Sean and cool. um, to have part of it be um, a songwriting seminar so that you guys can talk about your creative process and allow folks to um, ask questions for, you know, if they have inquisitive minds about that kind of stuff. And just to discuss the magic of, of what you guys do, really. Um, and that'll be on our farm in, in Claxton. Um, we have a, a cabin from the 1860s that uh, I believe it'll be held in. And then later that night, we'll have a concert as cool. well. So you guys can share your your music there, and um, yeah, more details to follow about all that. Uh, but um, oh. you can find tickets, you know, on my um, Facebook page and website, and um, I'm sure you guys will will post stuff we about that will, as well. We'll promote it, yeah, right here so on that's something a, in the water. That's already up. The tickets? No, um, not yet, but it'll okay. be. Um, We've got to decide on a date. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Okay. It'll probably mm-hmm. be held, you know, early part of next year. Probably when it warms up a little bit because that'll be okay. near the near the winter okay. so awesome. yeah can't yeah. wait that's gonna be fun yeah that will be a lot of fun 
Absolutely. And well, folks, we certainly thank uh, y'all for watching, and we thank our beautiful, talented, <laughs> little sis, multi instrumentalist little sister, Micah Bond. I appreciate that. Thank for you being so much our for guest me. tonight. Thanks uh, so much. It was wonderful. You were wonderful. <laughs> and uh, I hope that we turned a lot of our uh, viewers on to something new tonight. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, it's been just a joy. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Such a such a fan of you guys. <laughs> well, so, as we said that. earlier, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> That's right. So we'll see you all next time on Something in the Water. Just my